2 Timothy chapter 4 this evening. I heard that somebody this week caught a big fish. How, how big was it? Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. All right. Very good. Yeah, I've, I've caught them that big before. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Second Timothy chapter, chapter 4. We're uh, looking at faithfulness and reward. Uh, we just looked briefly this, this morning at uh, just the, the urgency, really, of living our life now. And uh, we want to look at uh, verses, mainly verses 6 through 8 tonight, at... Uh, Really, Paul's testimony, in a sense, and uh, his looking forward to what God had for him beyond this life. Uh, he'd given it a charge to Timothy in the first five verses, and uh, really the, the urgency of the charge was, uh, he's saying to Timothy, you need to fulfill this because I'm not going to be around. <laughs> uh, you're going to have to do this. And, you know, that's, that's true of all of us, really, you know, someday we're we're going to be gone, and uh, there have to be others to, to take our place, and uh, Paul was, was really concerned that Timothy be a, a, continue to be, I should say, a faithful man. Yeah, let me read, verse, starting in verse 6, we'll just read the three verses. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto them also that love is appearing. Uh, next week we'll look at, at some of the rest of the, of the chapter, but uh, tonight we, we look at his testimony. We talked this morning about uh, now. Uh, I saw one outline. They, they outlined this. Uh, he looks around. He looks back. He looks forward. Uh, you know, he's, he's looking around in, in this verse 6. Uh, what was going on in his life right then? He, he said, I'm ready to be offered. And uh, the, the word that's used there has to do with a, a drink offering. I don't know if you're familiar with some of the offerings in the Old Testament, but one of them was a drink offering where a, a liquid would be poured out uh, as an offering uh, to the Lord. And uh, you know, that, he's saying that's, that's what his, he considered his life to be, just whatever God wanted to do with it. It was, it was to be sacrificed. It was to be given to the Lord. It made me think of the situation in Mark chapter 14 where uh, Jesus was anointed. He was in the house of uh, Simon and a woman came and, and she had an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard and she, she put it on Jesus. And uh, there was those there, it's, it's Mark uh, 14.4, who said, why was this waste of the ointment made? And it made me think, if you give your life as a sacrifice to the Lord, there's a lot of people who say, what a waste of a life. But Jesus said of that woman, she said, let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. If you give your life for, to the Lord and for the Lord, God will say, that's a good thing. Well done. Now, the world will say, don't bother. Now, we were out door knocking one time, oh, it's been a while ago, and one of the men that was, was with me, he said, there was a lady said to him, surely a grown man like you could find something worthwhile to do rather than bothering people. <laughs> and you know, that's, that's the world's attitude a lot of times when, when we're out trying to talk to them about the Lord and you know, rescue their soul. They say, man, can you find something worthwhile to do? Uh, pouring our life out as, a, as an offering to the Lord. Not everyone is going to bless you for that. But I can guarantee you this, the, the folks that get saved will. They'll say thank you. Uh, and he, he said, I, I'm now ready to be offered. He said, my departure is near. If you've ever gone on a trip, this is a different kind of trip than what we normally go on, but uh, you know, there, there's some, some getting ready. Uh, there's some expectation and priorities and so on. Yeah, I, I just love the feeling of sitting on an airplane, no keys in my pocket, nothing I can do even if I had to. You know, you just, you, you're ready to go. And, you know, that's the way it should be uh, when it comes our time to, uh, for the Lord to take us home. Uh, you know, we should have fulfilled our, our obligations to the Lord. We need to be, uh, to be ready. But this is not a trip to a familiar harbor. 
this is a trip, trip leaving the familiar and, and heading out, you know, heading out into some place we, we've never been uh, to be with the Lord. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5, in verse, verse, the first four verses, he uses the illustration of our house as a tabernacle. Interesting words. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, yeah, 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. You know, in, in our body, boy, we groan, don't we? Uh, Dola's brother lives in Chiapas, Mexico, and when that earthquake came, boy, their house, their church, it groaned, you know. Things were moving, things were falling. And, uh, you know, in our physical body, uh, it's a struggle. And he says in verse 3, If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. He says our growing is not just to be shed of this life, it's to be with the Lord, to have what God has for us in, in heaven and in the future. Uh, you know, we're, as a church and uh, as individuals, constantly dealing with death. You know, we have people we're praying for that, you, you know, we don't know uh, whether God's going to take them home or, or give them uh, many more years. And uh, we need to keep in mind, you know, God does say that death is an enemy. It's the last enemy that will be destroyed. But yet for a Christian, it's a, it's a strange thing because, you know, death is the door to heaven. And, uh, you know, when somebody, if you've ever been to the airport, you'll, you'll see people crying, and they're just going to Sydney or, you know, going to Bali or something. Uh, but when somebody goes to heaven or when someone dies, uh, you know, we don't, we don't see them for a while, and it's, it's a difficult thing. Uh, as, as Christians, we look forward to what God has for us in eternity. And, you know, Paul was, was understanding that the time of his departure was at hand. I don't know how he knew. I don't know what he knew. Uh, but we know historically that uh, he was taken from prison and he was, he was beheaded. Uh, he was put to death for the, for the Lord. He doesn't particularly sound depressed as you read these books. He, to me, he sounds kind of content. Now, there's, there is some loneliness that we'll, we'll look at. Uh, as we look at the end of the book, but you know, contrast that with a person like Belshazzar. Remember Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5? Boy, he thought he was, I don't know what it means, the bee's knees, <laughs> whatever that. <laughs> he thought he was really great. He was throwing a party, and God put a hand and wrote on the wall. You remember that? And they had to get Daniel to become interpret it. And Daniel said, this is what it means. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And it says, That night Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Yeah, what a difference between that and, and Paul's life and his attitude. I've fought the fight. I've finished the course. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And, uh, you know, he had lived his life uh, for the Lord. Makes me think of the man in Luke chapter 12 that God calls the rich fool. You know, he had everything this world could, could desire. And uh, yet the Lord says to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, a lot of our unhappiness comes when we don't have the treasures of this world. I mean, really. You know, when we don't have our health, when we don't have the things but God says the, the main things are the treasures in heaven. Now, Paul had offered his life as an offering to the Lord. Now, Paul was able to say, uh, you know, I'm ready to go. And we need to keep that in mind. We need to, like I said this morning, we need to use our now for the Lord. We, we don't know how long that will be. We need to use uh, the time that God gives us. So he looks around. He looks at where he is. But then he looks, he looks back in verse 7. I've fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've, I've kept the faith. He uses some illustrations, um, at least two of them are athletic. Uh, you know, the boxer, you know, fighting the fight. And really, living for Christ is, is a battle. There's a, I meant to bring my hymnal up here, let me grab that. 
There's a, a lot of good songs about fighting the fight. One of them is, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Now, this is the verse I wanted you to hear. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through blood-filled seas? Uh, you know, it, it's a battle to serve the Lord. And, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that we're going to have it, have it easy. Uh, I think we've read these verses before, but 1 Timothy 1.18, he says uh, that he gives Timothy this charge, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. He says, Timothy, fight a good fight. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. And uh, 2 Timothy 2, of course, we read verses 3 and 4 earlier. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, it, it, it's a battle. And we shouldn't be surprised. Uh, God has told us that. Uh, he, he was able to, uh, to look back and say, I've, I've done my best. I've, I've fought the fight. Then he uses the illustration of the runner. Uh, I've finished the course. Uh, I don't know if any of you are ever involved in athletics, but it, it's... You don't want to quit the race, you know. Uh, it's not always just winning. Sometimes it's just finishing. Uh, somehow, a few years ago, we got to watch in the Dakar Rally. I don't know if you even know what that is. It's, a, it's motorcycles and cars and trucks that race. It used to be across Africa. And it was, it's in, incredible. And people who, ra who race in that, they're just happy to finish. <laughs> they don't care who wins, just, just to finish. You know, that's, that's a lot like life. You know, we need to come right up to the finish and, and be, be trusting the Lord. That had always been Paul's goal. In uh, Acts chapter 20, earlier in his ministry, when he was uh, speaking to the pastors of Ephesus, Acts chapter 20, verse 22, he'd given them a, a message, and at, at the end, toward the end, he says, Now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. He just said, I know it's going to be bonds and afflictions. But listen to this. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You're right up to the end. He said, I want to be... Preaching for the Lord. He didn't just say that he wanted to finish. He said he wanted to finish with joy. I think that's important. You know, we don't want to have a dreadful life. We want to have a life of, of joy and the, the fruit of the Spirit as we, as we serve the Lord. As you look back, he could say, I've fought the fight. I've, I've finished the course. I think the third one might be a, a military illustration. I've kept the faith. You know, he's, he's guarded the truth. The Bible often talks about being overcomers. The book of Revelation, you know, when he talks to the churches, uh, many times he says, to him that overcometh. He talks about that. And God says we overcome by faith. Uh, I've kept the faith. Uh, 1 John chapter 5 and, and verse 4, he tells us that very thing. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Trusting the Lord, seeing what God has said, uh, sticking with it. Uh, I love how he puts it in Revelation 12, 11. Now, he doesn't use the word faith, but uh, he says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. It was more important to serve the Lord than their life. What a blessing it is to see that there's those who've, who've lived by faith. You know, we need to finish well. We need to ask the Lord to, to help us as we go on in our life, to, to keep trusting Him, uh, to keep on. Uh, I came across a, an account this week. It's a true story. It happened in the United States, eastern United States, some years ago. Uh, a train traveling along got, I don't know if you know what it means, a, a hot box. I guess the bearings started heating up, and if they didn't stop, it would burst into flames, and they could even wreck. Uh, so the train had to stop. 
Well, they sent a flagman out to make sure that no other train uh, would run into them. And uh, as he waved the flag, a, a train came, and, and it just kept going and ran into the other train. The, uh, the engineer of the second train, when he saw what was happening, he actually jumped out and, and survived. And as they were uh, at a tribunal about it, you know, they asked him, you know, why, why, did you, why didn't you stop? He said, well, he was wa waving a yellow flag. And uh, I just thought that meant there's you know, caution, so I slowed down. And they asked the, the flagman, what, you know, wh what did you do? They said, well, he said, I waved the red flag. And man, he, he just, he didn't stop. He just went right past me. The judge said, well, get the flag. And when they brought the flag in, and it took him a while to find it, age and weather had turned it a dirty yellow. It had been a red flag, but no longer. And you know, unfortunately, many times, even as Christians, we, we don't, uh, what's, what's the word he uses here? Uh, I'm in the wrong chapter. We don't follow through to the end. We let our lives fade. Uh, he said, uh, he was able to say, I've, I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. We need to be careful that we don't let the, the things of God's message diminish in our life. There's a song that we sing in our hymnal, Jesus led me all the way. You know, that, that needs to be the case. It, it's not just when we're young or when we're middle-aged. We need to trust the Lord all through life's journey, uh, right through to the end. I found my dad a blessing in that. Now, you know, my dad wasn't a perfect man, but uh, in his old age, uh, he kept serving the Lord. I remember his pastor saying, boy, it's like having an unpaid assistant. <laughs> uh, he reached a point where physically he just couldn't do all the things he'd done. Uh, but, you know, there, uh, he and my mom, mom were faithful. And what a blessing that, that was to see, and a, a great example. Paul was, was able to look around and see what the Lord was doing. Paul was able to look back and say, yeah, uh, I've done my best to, uh, to serve the Lord. And as a result, he was able to look forward. Verse 8, henceforth. You know, that has to do with as a result. You know, in life, we do get results. <laughs> uh, we don't always like them. The, the way we live, the things we do bring in results. You know, if we're careless in our business, we're probably going to not succeed. Um, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. You know, the Bible says if, if we'll, uh, what we do will we'll have a result. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, he says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Uh, we're going to be judged. Uh, we're going to get results. Uh, take a look there in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, well, it's not there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and uh, verse 12. Christians aren't going to be judged regarding their salvation. When you get saved, the Bible says it's, it's eternal life. It says no one can pluck you out of, out of God's hands. But our, our works will be judged. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, this is probably one of the easiest passages to understand on this. Uh, verse 12. Uh, verse 11 talks about being on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And then he says, If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. He's saying, we're going to be judged. There, there's going to be a reward or, or a loss of reward. Uh, our works will be, will be judged. The Bible says we're not saved by works. Uh, very, very plainly. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, that's got to be one of the plainest scriptures uh, that there is, not of works. We're not saved by works. Uh, in Titus uh, chapter 3 and verse 4, he talks about salvation. The, the kindness of and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we've done, 
but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Over and over in those verses he says, we're saved by grace, we're saved by his mercy. Uh, but we're saved, Ephesians 2.10 says, unto good works. We're not saved by our works, but God saves us. He has a purpose for us, uh, that we would serve him. You know, when he finishes saying, not of works lest any man should boast, he says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in there. Now, that's God's purpose for us. We should do good things. <laughs> you know, the world uses that as a, to make fun of us. You know, oh, they're do-gooders. I mean, you're a kid, it's a goody two-shoes, you know. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I'd, much have a, I'd much rather have a neighbor that does good, good things than bad things. Um, God has called us as Christians unto good works. In uh, 1 Timothy Chapter 6, verses 18 and 19. It's almost at the end of, of the book, 1 Timothy. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about those that have been blessed. He says that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. You know, doing good things is having a grip on eternal life. You know, we have a eternity in view. In uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, he says, Be not weary in well-doing. He says that several times. You know, God tells us to live and to compete to win the prize. You know, I think sometimes as, as Christians, we devalue this, this thing of rewards. Uh, I think it's going to be a big deal in heaven. And uh, I think we'll, we'll regret if, if we've not... Uh, like Paul, you know, tr tried to serve the Lord and to, to, to do the right thing. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. T take a look there, if you would, 1 Corinthians 9. <clears throat> Paul often used athletic illustrations. And uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? But one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. Now, what's he saying there? Try to win. <laughs> you know, we're living in a world today where everybody wins, you know. Everybody's a winner. Uh, well, God says we need to do our best. You know, not just compete. Try to win. Try to do what God would, would have us to do. Now, look at verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We just kind of take it for granted that Olympic athletes, man, they're, gonna, they're really going to go all out. Yeah, we expect that of them. And yet, have you ever really thought about what they, what they win? They say one of the most disappointing people to be is a former Olympic athlete. <laughs> I mean, what a drop, you know. That's just a temporary prize. There have been people who've sold their gold medals, you know, because they, they needed the money. He so said, we do it for an incorruptible. So he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. You know, people have lost races physically because they got lost. <laughs> they couldn't find where to go. Uh, he says, we don't need to run uncertainly. We need to know where we're going. So fight it, not as one that beateth the air. He used to talk about shadow boxing. Uh, listen, what we're in is, it, it's not pretend. It's not a game. Uh, it's a fight. It's a real fight. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. <coughs> lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway, that I would not be approved. God wants us to compete. He wants us to, uh, to win. He wants us to, to strive, to fight, to finish, to keep on. And he talks about the rewards uh, that are there. One is there. Uh, it's one of the reasons I had you turn to 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 25 is, is where we talk about the incorruptible crown. You know, as I was thinking about this this week, I thought... Uh, I like this crown. It does, it's, not, it's not for a person who's flashy. It's not, for, you know, it's not necessary for you to be the, the greatest at anything to get this crown. You just need to be faithful. And you know what? Anybody can be faithful. 
You just have to do what God asks you to do. Just do it faithfully. You know, reading your Bible, praying, being part of church. You know, just faithfully. Every time the door is open, be there. Well, if a burglar is coming, open the door. You don't have to be there for that. But, uh, you know, uh, we need to be faithful. We need to trust the Lord, the incorruptible crown. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. This is where we started. I just mentioned these, these different crowns that we see in, in the Scripture. 2 Timothy 4, 8 talks about the crown of righteousness. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Here is a crown for loving his appearing. Yeah, you, can, you can identify with that. You've had a time in your life when you were really looking forward to seeing someone. For different reasons. Sometimes it might be the, the boss and you're going to get rewarded financially. Boy, he's going to come and see what we've done and man, he's going to be pleased. Or sometimes maybe you didn't want to see him because <laughs> you know, he wouldn't want to be pleased. Or it's just someone you loved and man, they're coming. I remember when I was a boy, my, my brother had been away at school. I, I must have been... I don't know how old I was, maybe eight or something. And he was driving way far away, hundreds of miles. And I went out to Pacific Avenue, and I sat and I waited, looking. <laughs> he's, he's nine years older than me. He seemed like a man to me. And, uh, you know, you look, and there's a, there's a joy in looking for someone that you love. That's what he's saying. We need to love his appearing. We need to be excited about the Lord coming. We need to be prepared. You know, when my wife goes away, Man, when I, I know she's coming back, I make sure that house is spotless. It's useless, because as soon as she gets home, she starts throwing things everywhere. But <laughs> yeah, looking forward to, to uh, the appearing. And uh, yeah, that's the way it is with the Lord. You can think about that. There's a lot of things that would characterize uh, loving the Lord's appearing. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19... It talks about the crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. This is a, a great crown. He says, What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. The crown of rejoicing is the soul winner's crown. And when you get to heaven and there's someone there because you told them about Jesus, and he's saying to them, you're going to be my crown. <laughs> you know, what a blessing it'll be to have someone say, thank you. Thank you for telling me about the Lord. And uh, that's a crown that we should, we should compete for. <laughs> it's not that we compete with each other. We just want to, to please the Lord. There's a crown in 1 Peter chapter 5. It's the crown of glory. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses, I'll start reading in verse 2. And I've got to tell you, this is the pastor's crown, the faithful pastor's crown. He says, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Crown of glory for, the, for faithful pastors. And one more, James chapter 1, verse 12 the crown of life. James chapter 1, verse 12. <clears throat> Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Yeah, that, that's why we would resist temptation, isn't it? It's because we, we love the Lord. Uh, enduring temptation. Uh, there's a song we sing, Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed? to resist some temptation strong. Uh, it always makes my heart ache when I, I sing that, because, and we've all failed. But you know, the Bible also says there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. You know, we, we can endure temptation. And uh, we should endure temptation uh, if we love the Lord. Now, our testimony is not going to be Paul's testimony. He, he was an apostle. None of us can be apostles. And 
He lived in a different time and place. And I, I think Paul had some regrets because he had some things that he'd done before he was a Christian that he mentions every once in a while. But you know, Paul knows, and, and you know, you can't change the past. It's no good. If you're not going to learn from the past, it's no good messing with it. But there's some things that we can do. Number one, we can make sure that we're saved right now. And the Bible says that we can, uh, we can be saved. He's written these things that we can know that we have eternal life. And secondly, you can live faithfully for the Lord starting today. You know, whatever your, your past is, uh, you can give him today. And uh, God can bless it. You know, Jesus could come today. I hope like Paul that we will strive to be able to say, I'm now ready, ready to be offered. I fought a good fight. I've kept the course. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Uh, I think we should strive for that every day, uh, to trust the Lord and, and, and to serve Him. We're going to take our hymnals and go to a song. It's not a normal invitation song. It's Glad Day, page 401. Jesus could come today. Now, you're going to have to stand up for this. You're going to have to throw your head back and sing on this one, all right? Page 401. Uh, Azrael, you come and lead us in at least a couple verses on this.